In the final example, we're going to take a look at shear in a thin plate cross-section. Okay, so a thin plate cross-section, something like this I-beam here, we are going to apply a vertical shear force to this beam, and we want to figure out where, what the shear stresses are throughout the cross-section. All right, my engineering superheroes, let's take a look at shear flow in thin plate cross-sections. So I want to consider this I section here. So I have a vertical shear force V applied to the cross-section in uh, what's the negative Y axis. So I'm going to give myself uh, X, Y, and Z axis here so I have some reference uh, point for description of our shear stresses. Alright, so as we apply a vertical shear force V downwards, we would assume that the cross-section would resist that force with upward uh, resistance of the material. And this resistance will be distributed across the area of the material as a shear stress. Alright, easy enough. Vertical uh, shear force V is down and we have resistance shear stress in red uh, acting upward. So now I want to take a look at one of these uh, shear stresses and draw at the element level. So like we did with plane stress and we would draw elements, I want to do the same here uh, in the thin plate cross section. So I'm going to take a chunk out of this I-beam, that chunk in black right there, and I'll redraw that chunk down below. And we see that because of the applied shear force, we are proposing that we have a vertical upward shear stress that resists that force. Well, at the element level, based on equilibrium, if this is to be the case, then we also have to have a corresponding shear stress on the top surface of this block. So again, go back to plane stress when we talked about plane stress in more circle. We would always have equal, uh, these kind of equalizing shear forces. However, on the very top surface here, this is not possible because the top surface is not subjected to shear. So why is that? Why is this one not possible? We hypothesize that as we apply a downward shear force, there's a shear stress in the material that resists the applied force. You know, and that has to happen because of equilibrium. Now we said that that vertical shear stress is, you know, throughout the entire section. So if that is to happen, then we would say in this bottom section, we have a vertical shear stress upward. Now if we look at the element level, that means that in the longitudinal direction, if I have an upward shear stress, I would have to have a shear stress in this direction longitudinally to balance that shear stress. Now that's not possible in this case because this is what we call a free surface. And so the free surface, unless I have an externally applied force that's gripping this surface or sliding it, and I'm actually applying some sort of shear stress to the surface, then my shear stress on the surface has to be zero. And so if I have zero shear stress in the longitudinal direction, then I can't have a vertical shear stress in, uh, through the thickness of the flange because it won't be in equilibrium. Now we know from shear stress formulation that we do have to have some sort of longitudinal shear stress to balance out equilibrium in the length of the beam. So we saw that in the derivation. Recall that because DFL prime is not the same as DFR prime, we need to have the additional term tau times TDX to balance out our forces in the longitudinal direction of the beam. And so I still need to have this, or this longitudinal shear stress. And so therefore the shear stress forms on the side of the element, so not on the free edge side, but in the material. And so it forms on the side through the thickness here and so therefore, I then, from equilibrium, have to have a shear stress in this portion that is acting to the left. And so we'll then see that in thin plate cross-sections, uh, our shear stresses in the, in the cross-section don't always have to be up, uh, but they can also be going sideways uh, 
as well. So we'll see how we could draw those shear flow uh, through the cross section in what we call a shear flow diagram. Hopefully you followed that conversation and understand that now we can't have a vertical shear stress on the front face of that element. However, we do have to have that longitudinal shear stress term to balance out the forces in the along the length of the beam. And so since I still need that shear stress in order to be in equilibrium, I now have to have a horizontal shear stress on the front face of that element. So we'll see that the shear stress that we guessed at originally is not really the true shear flow in this thin plate cross section. And again, we said that it's not possible to be upward on the front face there everywhere because the shear force is not present on the free surface of that beam. And I'm just going to go ahead and label this shear stress as well so that we know that this we still need some sort of tau zx to form to satisfy equilibrium. If that's the case, let's go ahead and take a look at the actual shear flow through this thin plate cross section. We have in the web of the I-beam, the shear is being opposed by the shear stress in the material, and then we have in the thin plate portion we just considered, we have a horizontal shear. And I like to think of this as almost like a river, so I always start with kind of the shear stress that's opposing the vertically applied shear, and then think about how like the river would flow. We would have shear stress on the bottom flange working from zero on the outside edge on the flange tips, building up as we get closer to the center, then heading upward through the web and then flowing out through the top flange. So with that idea of it being almost like a uh, water or river, uh, that's how I'm gonna draw the shear flow for these cross sections. So for the T, we would start in the web of the T and it would go vertically upward and then it would flow outward through the flange. For this channel shape, this lip channel shape, I start in the two uh, flanges of the channel. They would have to be upward because we always have to oppose that shear force. And then I will just draw the extension of that as uh, if we think of shear flow again like a river, this would be how it would act. Um, from the axis of symmetry through the middle, it would be flowing outward, up, and then to the lip of the channel. Lastly, we'll look at the tube shape. Again, I'll draw in my first shear stresses to oppose the vertically applied shear. And now from that, I can just kind of see that the river would flow upward to the center, to this axis of symmetry, and then working our way from the bottom, it would be flowing outward up to the middle and around the shape. So this is just sort of a qualitative look at shear flow in these cross sections. Uh, some of these cross sections, the shear flow is more difficult to calculate than in others. Uh, we're not going to get into that. We'll save that for maybe an advanced mechanics course in your future. Um, but for now, we would just want to talk about, we'll talk about the I-beam. Uh, we often see that I-beam, at least in structural engineering applications, and this would be a good opportunity to make sure we understand how the shear stress at a particular point can be calculated even if we have a thin plate cross section. So the formula remains the same, tau equals VQ over IT. So uh, that will remain the same for this particular beam. Working through our variables, V is 200 kips. That's specified in the problem statement. So we say that this W18 by 71 beam has 200 kips acting on it. And again, we could pull this from a shear diagram for the beam if we had one. Next, because we're interested in the shear stress at point A, I want to look at the value for Q, but Q at the point A. So in my cross section, I've gone ahead and drawn a portion of my shear flow that we had from the previous page. 
And now I want to isolate section A. Now since it's a thin plate element, I want to isolate section A as it's zero at the flange tip and then it builds up through the along the flange. And because it's not very thick, it's not really important where we are in the depth of that because the shear flow is going horizontally. So the area shaded in blue is the Q that I need to calculate. So Q is the summation of Y bar A. So now I have to find Y bar to the center of gravity of that segment. That can be expressed by 8.44 inches plus half the thickness of the flange. So 8.44 inches plus 0.810 inches divided by 2. The area of the shaded portion in blue is 0.81 inches times 1.5 inches. So that's the area of this segment. And then we can get the value for Q. Q calculates to be 10.7467 inches cubed. Again, I like to think at the flange tip, the Q would be zero, and then Q reaches a maximum at the neutral axis. So I only want to take the portion from where Q was zero to the point of interest, which is A, in my calculation for QA. Finally, at my point of interest, at point A, my thickness has to be the thickness across that thin plate, which is 0 0.810 inches. So that'll be our value for our thickness. I've written in there the moment of inertia is 1167.4 inches to the fourth. Uh, you can go back a few lessons and take a look at the example on how we calculated that moment of inertia. All right, so we're ready to calculate shear stress. We have all of the values that we need. So we're just go, going to plug in our numbers. Tau equals 200 kips times 10.7467 inches cubed divided by 1167.4 inches to the fourth divided by 0 0.810 inches. So doing our calculation, we find that the shear stress at point A is 2.273 KSI. Right, now you know how to calculate shear stress in thin plate cross sections, especially for I-beams. Hopefully you also understand how the shear stress formula can be applied at various points throughout the cross section by only looking at the area of the cross section up to that point.